If there's anybody who doesn't deserve to be standing here in front of y'all today, it's me. I don't deserve to be here. And it's miraculous that I'm standing here before you. My name is Joseph Daniel Bailey uh, at the shop in Houston, Setagus. They call me Bailey. Uh, out in the world, I'm known as Texas Joe Bailey, the famous country music singer. You might have heard of me. That's a joke. Uh, I, let, let's just, if I say anything awkward that you think might be funny, feel free to go ahead and laugh just to make me feel good. Because otherwise I'm going to be like, oh. <laughs> um, I'm a half breed hood rat from the north side of Houston, Texas. Anybody know about the north side of Houston, Texas? There we go, right there. That's my right there. Uh, my father was a tall white man. My mother was a short, beautiful Hispanic. They got together and what they created is the specimen you see before you today. <laughs> I have a lot of pride in my city of Houston. I was, I was born in the north side where um, my mother's family ran. My dad's a country boy. He moved to Houston, first chance he got, where he met my beautiful mother. Her family was a Rizzo family. My uncles were gangsters. They ran that part of town. So that afforded me and my cousin Jerry the freedom to run around that area without any worries. Because if something happened to us, the repercussions on whoever did it was going to be bad. It was our playground. He would always try to convince me to go down there to Hardy Street to the uh, SP mechanic shop and watch the guys work on the locomotives, put pennies on the line. And he was just fascinated with the trains and he was fascinated with the whole ordeal of how it all operated. But I didn't care about any of that. I was into chicks. Pardon, can I say that? I was into women and, uh, and uh, fast living. I mean, as, much, as fast living as you can be at when you're seven years old, I was into that. So I didn't really care about it too much, so I wouldn't go down there with him. But fast forward to about 2002, he went up north to work with the CSX as a conductor. And around 2002, was able to get a job with UP uh, in Houston. And uh, I had been working in the uh, chemical plants. My father, had passed away when I was about 18 years old. And up until that point, I was spoiled rotten. Uh, my dad was a banker. Banking's more of a retail job today, but back when I was a kid, somehow or another, these guys can make a lot of money. I don't know what they did, but we went from living in the north side of Houston to moving out to uh, the suburbs, out of uh, Champions Forest area out north, close to the woodlands. We had no business being out there. We were like the Beverly Hillbillies, but there were a bunch of rich white kids and they all smoked a lot of pot and drank a lot of beer. So I wanted to fit in. So that's what I did. My dad passed away when I was 18. My mother, of course, had a rough time with that. So did I. I started using drugs and alcohol. Really, that became my daily medication. I smoked marijuana up until six months before I started with the railroad. It helped me feel, uh, as you can probably see, I'm kind of socially awkward. I don't really fit in. It's easier for me to talk to a big group of people like this than it is for me to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. And if you ever talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can see that I'm a little off. And uh, so uh, you're not alone. Thank you. So uh, so it made me feel it made me feel all right. I went to work at the chemical plants with my stepdad. My mother married a couple years later, so I went to work as a carpenter helper. Worked my way up to be a rigger and worked through the uh, the chemical plant, just like Bud and Urban Cowboy. I was that guy. And. Uh, I was smoking weed the whole time and I would carry a little Elmer's glue bottle of clean urine under my belt to keep it warm because it has to be warm. And uh, I did that for many years. And so then my cousin Jerry was like, hey man, you should come work at the railroad. And I was like, why not? Well, the railroad's more of a career. You know, when you're working in the chemical plants, you, you do a shutdown, you do a new construction, you chase job to job and, and it's never ending. Uh, so the railroad was a career, so I wanted to take that seriously. So on uh, Halloween of 2004, I put my application in uh, Union Pacific and I stopped smoking weed. I said, that's it. Done. When I applied, they had every, every job you could imagine. Uh, electrician, machinist, train service, apprentice, you name it. And I read the uh, qualifications for these jobs and I was I'm pretty... I'm a crafty guy, I'm not a complete idiot, you know, but uh, I read the qualifications for these jobs and it's like, the qualifications were just unbelievable. So then I got to this one that said mechanic shop laborer. And this is basically pushing a broom. I said, oh, I can do that. I said, you know what, I'll get in the door and then I'll work my way up to senior management and I'll run that way. So, and uh, so I applied for that job and I went and interviewed with a, a guy named Jess Jordan, and a gentleman was there by the name of Gerald Wilson. And Gerald's just passed away 
I just get teared up thinking about it. But uh, Gerald brought me in as a, as a fireman oiler, and uh, pardon me. And uh, it wasn't just pushing a broom, you know. It was it, it was uh, we actually got on these things, and we learned how to operate them, and we learned how to move them around. The job was spotting the mechanic shop. Once I started doing this job, all the guys that I hired in with, they, I want to be a machinist, I want to be an electrician. And I was watching these other crafts and they were making more money. And, uh, but I fell in love with being a fireman oiler. I fell in love with the chess match of knowing how to spot that shop by looking at everything out there and knowing what had to be done in the smallest amount of moves. I just fell in love with it. But with the absence of marijuana, and different struggles in my life, uh, I turned to alcohol. One of the guys that was there was uh, my mentor. He still is to this day. I talked to him about a monthly basis. His name was Joe Guerra. He's a fireman oiler, 30 plus years. When he met me, he saw himself in me when he was my age. I hired him when I was 29. And he was, he had, I think he had 30 years sober. And I started slipping up a little bit. You know, I pride myself on being a good worker and being on time and being where I'm supposed to be for the most part, you know, for three days out of the week. <laughs> and, uh, no, but I, I pride myself on keeping a clean calendar. And um, I started slipping up and Joe came to me and told me about the program. So I didn't hear anything about getting help. I didn't hear anything about surrendering my life to anything. I, I heard if I call this number, they're going to throw this absentee stuff out the door. And he's like, that's right. So I called the number, I put myself in the program and uh, they shipped me off to uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. So I go up there and I do 28 days and I get through there as quickly as possible because I have the ability to be the manipulator of systems and a dishonest liar. I have that gift. And uh, it comes with, it comes, it comes with the, uh, the sickness of addiction. It comes, it's, it might be the catalyst that starts it all, and I believe that is because anytime I break my code of honesty, which I, I work very hard not to, the stuff is about to hit the fan. That's the, that is the uh, medication that's going to make that go away. My dishonesty opens the door to my stumbling. So I get home and my wife at the time, she decided to throw a big party for me, arriving back from uh, rehab. Oh, wow. And so my whole family's there, and I hadn't been sober in 25 years since I was a kid, you know. And so uh, I come in, and they're all Woo balloons, and I'm like, uh, where do y'all think I went? Within a few weeks, I was back on that plane to Knoxville, Tennessee again, mm -hmm. and I went to a program called Relapse Recovery. Um, and this was all through the program, you know. And and what I really want to—I mean, I'm, I'm telling you a lot about myself. But I, what I really want to focus on is the end result and what this program did for me. I, I might glorify some old war stories here and there, and forgive me if that offends you, but I want to give you a picture of who I am and what brought me to be here today. I got it that time. I understood it. I understood what it meant to be sober, and the light came on. And uh, I came back, and I was the pillar of sobriety. It's just like a, I, I equate it to a, a newborn Christian when they... They got to tell everybody. I was telling everybody about sobriety and look at me, look what I've done. Look at, and um, eventually I faltered again. I made it about 11 and a half months and uh, my dishonesty led to me going back out. I started being dishonest with my wife. And uh, the only way I knew how to cope with that was to make it go away. And the only way to make that go away is to wash it away with drugs and alcohol, right? So I put myself back in again. And this time I was defeated. This time, I, you know, last time I had it. What am I doing wrong here? And I go through the program disgruntled, but somehow or another I make it through it again and I'm sent back again. They put me back to work. But uh, it's just a matter of time before I fall off again. And uh, I'm still with my, my first wife at the time. So I'm back to work and uh, I start drinking on the sly. Drinking on the slide, that means I'm drinking nobody, nobody's gonna know about it. I'm gonna do it right this time. So uh, I'm drinking quite a bit and um, my wife knows about it because she lives in the house and can't keep it from her. But 
I'm still trying to pretend like I'm doing the right thing out there uh, where we're at. And uh, one morning I get up and uh, I'm still drunk from the night before. I didn't know about stuff like Operation Red Block. I probably wouldn't have cared if I did know about it because it's more important for me to go to work because I'm a man. And uh, my wife comes downstairs and she's like, are you going to work? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to work. What do you think? And uh, so I open the refrigerator to make my lunch and there's a 24 ounce uh, can of Bud Light in there, open. And I'm like, I'll throw that away. So I go to throw it away and that baby's got some weight on it. I'm like, whoa, I'll throw that, I'll just drink it right now. You know, and then I'll feel better. I'll go to work, clock in, hide out somewhere till I'm good. <laughs> hey, these are the decisions I made. And so uh, I do that. I go, I go to work. I drink it on the way to work and I get there. I clock in and uh, I go hide out. And as I'm hiding out, I'm thinking, you know what? Corner store is right there. Use another one. So I get you know, I jump in the car, I head on down to the corner store and uh, I grab another one. Do this several times throughout the day and uh, I don't know, I guess I went into a blackout. Because the next thing I know, I'm sitting in my car and I wake up to Nurse Betty banging on the window and half the shops out there standing around my car. I got Dr. Dre's The Chronic blaring on the radio so loud I can't even hear what they're doing. I'm holding a pipe that I made from materials that I stole from in the shop there. Somewhere along the way I decided 32 was better than a 24. I got a 32 ounce between my legs and uh, now I'm caught. All those years of getting away with it, it's over. Now I'm 1.5. Man. But that's my one opportunity you know and what's funny about this it's nothing's funny about it but what is ironic about it when i volunteered for peer support and there were a bunch of people in this group that i don't i don't judge anyone or but i i imagine they hadn't really been through the types of things that i've been through with the questions i'm hearing them ask and every question that they would ask in this orientation was something that i had experienced already and then Karen would answer their questions and uh, just by the grace of my God alone, the scenarios that she would lay out for someone to still be employed after going through that scenario just so happened to somehow miraculously take place for me when I was in the depths of darkness. The Lord was always there for me to line things out for me to be here in front of you now. When she asked me to speak, I said, there's no way that I could possibly tell my story without giving all praise and glory to God who put me here in front of y'all today. Because without that, there is no story. Without that, there's no, what am I gonna get, get here to tell you? Yeah, I did it. I pulled it off again. They call me the wizard. No. When I was 18 years old, I picked up a DWI charge in Humble, Texas because a girl called me on the phone and said, hey, come see me. And I just got done drinking a six pack of tall boy red dogs. And I thought it was a good idea to go see her. DWI number one. Well, I work as a musician as well. I was playing with a band called Night Riders. We were playing at the Texas Saloon, Pasadena, Texas. And I was, at this time I was bad off on prescription drugs. Well, I've done it all folks. I'm not, if there's something you've done, I've done it too. DWI number two. So, after Brian Meyer and the rest of the shop catch me drinking in the parking lot, I have to go through the program. And I do. I go through the program. I complete it. I come back. I'm reinstated. And I go back to work. When a short amount of time, I, it's just not working out for me. It's just not happening. In a short amount of time, I fall off again and self-report once again. This time, Karen Thrall, who was the EAP at the time, tells me, I have to turn you over to the medical department because we've gone the gamut with you. We've done all we can do. And basically she's telling me, you're fired, you're a lost cause. There's nothing we can do to help you because you don't want the help, which hurt because I really did, but I just couldn't get it. I just couldn't, the light would not come on. Mark Jones calls me from uh, medical. He explains to me that uh, 
you are disqualified from service. And I'm like, man, I had it all, you know, until you've had this job taken away from you, you don't realize what this job is. I have such admiration and love for this company. It makes my coworkers sick because they've never had it taken away from them. Not you guys, the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> they've never had it taken away from them. So they don't understand how wonderful it really is. And on top of that, I already told you, I love my job. Right. When I'm moving locomotives, I'm somewhere else. I am, I can't even explain it. It's, I was born to do it. And, and the Lord put me right where I was supposed to be. And, uh, but now it's taken from me. I took it from myself. They tell me you're suspended. And uh, at some point in your life, if you ever get your stuff together, call us back and we'll take a look at it. But good luck. And so that was it. And uh, at the same time, I told you that I was dishonest with my wife. My wife left me at that time. I had a 3,000 square foot house in Baytown, Texas. And uh, she took everything out of that. She took all the money out of my bank account and left me basically homeless in a giant house with a couch and an old television. No electricity, no gas. I was burning cardboard boxes in a fireplace to stay warm. It was rock bottom for me. And uh, the wife that I have now, I used to date her in high school. She, one day she showed up on my doorstep and she said, we're gonna get you together. We're gonna, we're gonna straighten you out. And, and she did. And so she took over the business of what I was doing at the time, which was playing music, sing and play music, write songs, that type of thing. And she really did well with it. You know, she was able to prop me. She said, first thing we're gonna do is put you in some decent clothes and then we're gonna do this. We're gonna sell t-shirts, we're gonna sell hats. And she did great. I was probably making from, from 2014 when I was suspended to the time, to 2019, I was probably making between 60 and $75,000 a year playing music for a living, which is not a lot of money, but that's a living. When I was a kid, I always had dreams of being like George Strait. I never achieved that, but I made a living doing it. So I really did do it. So 2014, I pick up DWI number three. And this time they're not playing with me. I went to the county jail and I stayed there for four months. And then I was sentenced to two years, Texas Department of Criminal Justice, that I served in the Cofield unit in Tennessee Colony, which is the biggest penitentiary in the state of Texas. I'm a man of faith and I believe that the Lord allowed me to go to that penitentiary so I could see the worst of the worst while I was away, I rededicated my faith to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And people would come into that penitentiary and speak to everyone. And I made a commitment to do that when I got out. That's exactly what I did when I got out. I became a, a prison minister. And I also started documenting my health because at some point, maybe I want to reach out to Mark Jones. I did. I reached out to him and I sent him everything I had. And uh, he ignored me. And I had no idea that he was the director of health and medical. Now, when, I, when he disqualified me, he was the director of the Southern region, but now he was the top dog. And uh, one day I get a call on my phone. And he's like, hey, this is Mark Jones. I'm looking for Julio Sanchez. And I'm like, there's no Julio Sanchez here. This is Joseph Bailey. And he's like, oh, I'm like, I got you now. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I've been trying to get a hold of you for, I've been sending you my stuff over and this and that. And, and uh, so he took a look at it. The whole time this was going on, in my spirituality, I, I, I prayed to my God that, uh, that one day I'd be able to rectify the situation that I had with the railroad because I didn't like the way that that situation came to a close. I felt like it needed to be amended. So I asked for it specifically. I said, Lord, let me go back, even if I just clock in one more time and they fire me or I'll walk out or whatever, let me have this. Mark Jones calls me, he tells me that uh, he made a mistake when he disqualified me. Not only did I uh, get disqualified, but I had to forfeit my seniority and then I no longer work for the railroad. And this is after, now I've, now I've got about five years sober. This year I celebrated six years sober. I put in a lot of work and to hear him say that at the end, I couldn't accept it. So I contacted Kevin Craney, 
general chairman of the National Conference of Fire and Oilers. Didn't even know the guy. Just looked on the website. This guy looks like somebody good to talk to. <laughs> and I sent him an email, brief explanation. And he calls me. He's like, tell me a little bit more. So I told him the story. He says, uh, let me look into it. Well, two weeks later, I get a call from one of these nurses. He's like, hi, just calling to let you know that you're uh, reinstated. You need to call your manager and talk to him and, and uh, tell him you're ready to come back to work. I was like, man, I've been suspended for seven years. I don't even know who the manager is. I don't, who do you want me to call? <laughs> and she's like, hold on a second. I was like, well, you hold on. How, what's going on here? How is this happening? Seriously, I knew that Brian Cobb had the job now. And I keep a journal of my prayers, and I'd actually put his name in there. Lord, I want to hear from Brian Cobb. I need to hear from Brian Cobb. Lord, why haven't I heard from Brian Cobb? You promised me this in your word. You'll give me the desire of my heart. Why are you not giving me this, Father? I'm your son. I'm crying out, and but, but believing. And uh, she comes back to the phone, and she says, I made a mistake. You'll be getting a call from your manager, and you've been reinstated to service with your full seniority. And the feeling you're feeling right now, imagine what I was feeling. I was like, oh! 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 Yes. A couple days later, the phone rings. Hey, Joe. It's Brian. <laughs> Yes, you're coming back. <laughs> if there's anybody who doesn't deserve to be standing here in front of y'all today, it's me. But I am. And I'm with you guys. <laughs>